So welcome to the, the session on uh, architecture and fair priorities. Uh, we have uh, three presentation. Uh, Marta and Rob will uh, together uh, make the fair practices uh, uh, presentation or will make the intro and uh, Marta will run the multimeter. So thanks uh, uh, Marta and Rob to join today and, uh, and uh, report on the fair practices uh, activity. Uh, after that, uh, Rafael will uh, present uh, the, I mentioned in my uh, architecture update uh, a moment ago that uh, we will talk about the PID architecture and AI architecture document that have just been released. So Rafael will present uh, the PID one and the class will present the AI one. So uh, that's what we, we will do in the next hour. So with that, I will uh, hand over to Rob uh, to make the introduction, oh, the, to present, uh, introduce the fair practices um, uh, part, uh, fair, fair practices uh, presentation. Go ahead, uh, floor is yours, Rob, sorry. Uh, thank you, Jean-Francois. Uh, let me uh, look for my uh, screen to share with you. Um, so, uh, I will present to you the results of the Fair Practice uh, Task Force, which is part of the Fair, uh, the Fair Working uh, Group. Uh, what we did, uh, also starting at the beginning or at the halfway at uh, 2019, uh, is uh, to, to ask people around what uh, literature is there describing fair practice. So we've looked at a lot of documents that people have been uh, uh, making that describe the uh, in the literature how different communities are actually going about implementing fair. Um, we collected all those documents in a uh, spreadsheet separated by academic discipline and made a, uh, an analysis of how the, uh, uh, what was described factually about fair implementations, separating out what we found were the difficulties that people encountered, both technical difficulties and the, uh, the uh, the, the social difficulties, and on the other hand, what people found as solutions, both technical solutions and how they dealt with the uh, social inhib inhibitions or how they enabled the, uh, the working together. Then uh, uh, after this detailed analysis, we actually thought it, it, uh, we came to a good conclusion. So we had a report writing sprint, wrote a report and had a consultation period of almost two months this summer where uh, uh, everybody has been able to comment on the results. Uh, so the reference list is here. So if you get the slides, you can actually uh, uh, go there. We won't uh, go into that now, of course. In the report, we go into this disciplinary perspective. So we, we take the conclusions from the spreadsheet. And then uh, there is also a, uh, an explanation of the regional perspective, where eight different policy approaches of different countries in different regions, focusing on Europe, of course, uh, are being uh, presented. Uh, there is a chapter in, in our document also describing FAIR for software and other research uh, objects. And uh, we also try to address the differences between uh, different uh, communities. And in the end, we uh, ended up with six recommendations. And I'd like to go uh, into those six recommendations here a little bit deeper for uh, those of you who haven't uh, seen them. And these are recommendations that are meant for the people in, uh, in EOSC not only this year, but also at the final EOS next year, of course, the decision makers and the research funders uh, uh, who can decide what will uh, be working uh, from next year. So here you see the, the six recommendations. We will go each of them and each of them has identified which uh, of the uh, target audiences, uh, which of the stakeholders this is really uh, addressing. So, uh, sorry, this is uh, recommendation two. So apparently it skipped one slide. So the first one is to fund awareness raising, tra training education and community specific support. Uh, 
um, it is clear that we need people to be aware of FAIR and uh, of what needs to be done to actually implement uh, FAIR. And uh, in this case, it doesn't work to, uh, to treat everyone the same. So the differences between communities and what they, uh, what they will need to do need to be recognized when this uh, awareness raising is, uh, is being addressed. Recommendation two is uh, to fund the development, adoption and maintenance of community standards, tools and infrastructure. We notice really that uh, a collaborating uh, a community really works here. Uh, and some, a lot of the FAIR uh, principles actually mention community specific uh, issues and those community specific issues really uh, need to be funded as well. This is, this is uh, what this recommendation aims to, uh, to achieve. So development of standards, uh, the methods and the tools need to be uh, adapted for the, uh, uh, the different uh, groups. Um, we uh, need to make sure that uh, standards actually are adopted. Uh, proliferation of alternatives is a, a danger to interoperability. And unfortunately, as we see now, uh, uh, the academic recognition for making a new standard is larger than the academic recognition for using an existing standard. And these kind of things need to be addressed. And of course, we need to have the appropriate expertise available. Uh, the re next recommendation is to incentivize development of community governance. So um, the uh, uh, bringing actually people together into groups that are uh, organized in the community and by the community actually really works. And uh, the standards development needs to be community driven. The development and the uh, maintaining of the standard is really good. Also, we, we see that already in communities that are tightly organized that they are uh, often further along in this uh, process. So we really say that this is uh, helping for a community communities and that other communities should also uh, look for uh, for this kind of community governance. Um, for uh, recommendation four is to translate the FAIR guidelines for other digital objects. Um, the, uh, uh, it has been said already in earlier sessions as well uh, that software has different uh, uh, needs for fairness than uh, the data. There is a lot of focus on data so far, but uh, the guidelines for other digital objects are actually, as I said, one of the chapters and these need to be further uh, developed. A recommendation five is to reward and recognize improvements of fair practice. So they, uh, uh, we need to make sure that actually there are good incentives to be fair and to work in a fair way. It's very important also for, for uh, researchers in all of the uh, stages of their career to be uh, 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 recognized for their fair practice. And then uh, recommendation six, the last recommendation is that uh, we need to develop and monitor, monitor adequate policies for fair data and research objects. There is a, a, a clear uh, difference between uh, regions where policies are uh, more advanced in the region of fair, uh, where uh, fair data management planning is required. We see really a lot more progress. So we see that not only the bottom-up uh, uh, activities from the communities are necessary, but it also helps to have a driving force from policies. And of course, these policies need to be uh, monitored and uh, put together. They need to be interoperable. And uh, we need to make sure that the different regions, different countries uh, actually uh, get to the same level. So those are the six recommendations. Back to, uh, to the, uh, the overview uh, that we've made for the different stakeholders uh, who will be in the, uh, in the EOS next year. Now, there are a few points where uh, we would like to have your input. Uh, 
the so we, we won't have an open uh, question session uh, now. The open questions that you have for this uh, work uh, can be posed after lunch in the in the feedback session. Uh, but now we have three points, and I would hand, like to hand over to Marta to uh, continue this. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. And indeed, we would be uh, most grateful if you could help us answering some of the questions that we have uh, for our work, for the, that particular work, but also for the strategic uh, research innovation uh, agenda, the, the EOSC SHRIA document. There are some priorities that need to be established, which came out as uh, from our work. And we would really appreciate if you could give us some feedback on how to prioritize that work. I would like to do it via Mentimeter, and I would like to share my screen now. Yeah. So that means that I have to unshare my screen, and that should be done now. OK. I think I hope you are able to see my screen, and I hope that you are able to see the first question uh, now uh, available. Thank you. I can see that you already start prioritizing some of the recommendations. Uh, just for the people who are still getting in there, if you go to www.menti.com and use the code 2442027, we would be most grateful if you could help us prioritize some of those recommendations. I can't see the chat while I'm sharing my Mentimeter screen. So if there are some questions on the chat to me or to Rob, I would be grateful if someone could read them out to us. Yeah, so there is one comment from um, Yuri asking why the recommendations are all focusing on funding or financial incentives. What's the message to our community wait on funding and work for incentives? I think one of our recommendation was that there are lots of communities who already uh, developed a lot of made, made a lot of progress towards fair implementation, but there are a lot of communities who are still uh, lagging behind. And uh, to organize such community work, as Rob explained, unfortunately takes a lot of time and effort. And unless somebody invest the time and effort, and time and effort also means financial incentives, time costs money, then uh, that work will not happen. So in order to ensure that also those communities that don't yet have um, standards, that don't yet have established fair practices, that's really important that we strategically uh, try to help such communities and uh, incentivize such efforts. Rob, I was wondering if there is anything else that you would like to add from your side. No, this is really uh, the, the way I look at it as well. So uh, I, I am currently also working in uh, in Elixir, uh, which is a research infrastructure, and it is very hard actually to convince uh, funders sometimes to uh, to do this kind of organizational work, and therefore uh, we see it as essential that uh, that the, for funders. Uh, uh, look at this kind of organizational work as a fundamental to support the actual work in the research infrastructure. Uh, the, there are lots of uh, people inside the communities who would like to do this work, who need to write their work on, uh, on projects, and uh, making it a project to run this well is actually a guarantee to, uh, to do this. And, you know, very often one would say that uh, that work has to be done by the communities, by researchers, but researchers, of course, they are measured and assessed by the number of papers they produce still, unfortunately. So something needs to change in order for this work to be incentivized. And if it's really important that we have standards and good practices for EOS to become the reality. So if that's strategically important, there needs to be strategic investment to make this happen. Uh, just to read out loud, because I think we have the priorities that seems to be consistent right now. And uh, as the first priority, we have to fund development, adoption and maintenance of community standards, tools and infrastructure. Uh, the second most important is to fund awareness, raising, training, education and community specific support. Then we have reward and recognize improvement of fair practice. 
develop and monitor adequate policies for fair data and research objects, incentivize development of community governance. And at the moment, the, the last priority is to translate fair guidelines for other digital objects. But I think I'm quite glad, I don't know, Rob, what you see, but I'm quite happy that it seems that you or the people who are now uh, prioritizing the recommendations seems to agree with us that we need to make indeed some strategic funding available to make this happen. We have two other questions uh, for you. I will just move my change my slide. Uh, oh, thank you so much. I can see that people already were able to add some comments. Uh, the question was whether you're aware of any existing efforts that are already realizing our recommendations. And uh, I would just try to read out uh, loud some of them. Please uh, feel free to continue contributing uh, your ideas about the efforts which are already ongoing. So we have GoFair, Fair Sharing. Disco.eu is investing time and effort to establish the necessary standards for fair digital specimens. Thank you for that. We have the Helmholtz Metadata Collaboration Platform. That's a really good one. Elixir work, of course. And then I'm just going to scroll down further. Uh, the Swedish National Data Service, uh, the German uh, NFDI, Fair for Research Software Working Group, indeed, EOSC Life, Fair for Health Project. Thank you very much for that. CESAR, indeed, document on next generation metrics, indeed. Today, I think, is also a webinar of CESAR about uh, uh, assessment, indeed. Very fair. Phoenix. I can see that some of those uh, projects are being repeated, and I think most of them, from what I can recognize, are already captured as references in our work, which I think is very encouraging. Astronomy, indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will then, um, if you would like to contribute some more ideas, references, we would be most grateful. But meantime, for the sake of time and the other presenters, I will move to the next slide and ask you, uh, that's a difficult question, of course, we re do realize, but if you have some contributions or ideas that you would like to share on how to realize proper rewards and recognition for fair actions. We would greatly appreciate that. And that's also something uh, that would make a big contribution to the EOSC Sharia. So very important ideas if you have something to contribute. So I can see in there development of a fair like profile. Indeed, there were some ideas before about openness profile. Indeed, fair like profile could really help make academic credit system in place for open data in open science. Certification of fair enabling repositories. I think that's something we already have in place and indeed useful to emphasize. Improvement of tenure track indeed. National level and organizations are here absolutely a key here absolutely that can't be done in isolation in recognizing the involvement of researcher in fair principles in their career, absolutely, indeed. Uh, think about data reusability level and research reproducibility in, instead of impact factor, indeed. Career evaluation, absolutely. And national and institutional recognition and rewards for data stewardship roles. Include relevant statements in funding calls. That's something that uh, we indeed had uh, received uh, suggestions for that repeatedly. Encourage academic institutions and other employers to not only look for scientific and pedag pedagogical merits when hiring new staff. They don't have to be monetary. Researchers appreciate extra exposure with whatever channels are available. Very good point indeed. Open badges, changing criteria for research assessment certification of fairness. 
fair badge for researchers and repositories. Lots of really good ideas. Uh, we really appreciate that and we will revise uh, your feedback in detail. But very much appreciated. I think that seems to be like the key messages I can uh, I can summarize are the badges, indeed some sort of fairness assessment index. That I think would be nice feedback for the metrics uh, uh, task force. And indeed overall thinking of reassessing, changing the way that researchers are being assessed, both in terms of grant applications and tenure track. Thank you so much for your contribution. Really appreciate that. That means a lot. I currently stop sharing to ensure that the other presenters have sufficient time to talk about their work. But myself and Rob will be also available for questions later on at the EOS clinic. Thank you so much, Rob Francois. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Rob. Uh, that was a very lively uh, presentation and very informative for everybody. Uh, so now I will uh, give the floor, we get into uh, the trenches of uh, uh, technology. So uh, I'll give the floor to Raphael uh, to tell us about the, the PID architecture and where we stand at the moment. Raphael? Raphael? Uh, Raphael, you're still yeah. muted. Uh, yeah, no, I got it. Um, okay, thanks Jean-Francois, and uh, as was already indicated, we are switching gears a little bit now. It will become um, more narrow in scope and more technical, given the nature of the topic to be addressed now. Uh, as many here in the audience may probably uh, know or remember, uh, uh, persistence identifiers have been on the agenda uh, of two groups from the onset. Um, and uh, there have been task forces established to address those, uh, one in the area of PID policies together with the Fair Working Group uh, that was pre uh, uh, already presented. And another task force was focusing uh, more on the technical aspects um, uh, of PID systems. And this is what I'm going to present now. And um, I think I need to move my slides here. Um, before I dive into this, I would like to stress the fact that, like so many other activities here, this is truly a team effort. And the team lead, Ulrich Schwartmann, who is uh, uh, in the audience from GWDG in Germany, uh, was really the key driving force keeping us together and focused. And without his deep expertise and continued commitment, I don't think we would have gotten where we are. Uh, members contributing to this, including myself, you see listed here. And the document that I mostly refer to uh, has been uh, open to the public uh, just recently. Uh, you find the URL here. I think this URL has also been already uh, uh, been distributed uh, through various channels, including email conversations to you. Um, while it is still to a certain extent work in progress, I think it is substantial enough uh, 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 to warrant um, uh, uh, public consultation. And uh, in order to give you an idea what we are covering in that document, not in that talk, I have to say, but in that document, um, uh, uh, of course, we start out uh, uh, laying the ground uh, what PID systems uh, are uh, generally used for or could be used for. Uh, uh, who is a uh, target audience, and then, of course, what already exists. As I think everyone here knows, uh, 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 PID systems have been around for decades, and I say systems because there's actually more than one. But still, it might, uh, uh, we considered it appropriate to dive further into details in actually uh, uh, outlining um, uh, uh, components, activities, and actors uh, uh, in the process. As we will see in a moment, there is more to the topic than most people actually would assume, I guess. Um, other issues we've briefly touched on uh, uh, include certification. Implementations actually uh, 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 cover a lot of ground. So uh, 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 what's out there, both from conceptual as well as technical, uh, um, aspects. 
uh, a lot of similarities of PID systems can be actually found with the domain name system that is one of the backbones of the internet as we know it today. And this is discussed performance and sc uh, scalability is of course uh, uh, important as is security, reliability and resilience when we are talking about key architecture, uh, 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 key components of such a system. And all those I actually uh, uh, won't cover, but uh, I will mostly focus on the gaps that we have actually identified in the existing PID landscapes and the challenges uh, that we are facing today and that provide uh, uh, room for investigation and development. But before I do so, uh, uh, I would also uh, uh, point you to the fact that uh, in defining the um, uh, uh, components, the actors and the actions, we've generated actually a number of uh, uh, UML diagrams, uh, 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 a very simple one you see here, which from a consumer's point of view may actually already uh, uh, cover everything there, uh, uh, there is or could be. And that seems uh, uh, comparatively simple. But if you switch to the other side, a, a PID service provider or the entire system, then things can easily become a bit more involved. And there are a, a couple of components actually outlined here that I do not assume anyone, uh, everyone in the audience to be familiar with, because uh, from my understanding at least, um, uh, I do not take it for granted that uh, everyone is necessarily aware of the fact that many PID systems, not necessarily all, but uh, uh, some uh, do support the association of uh, uh, metadata with a, a PID uh, uh, and that together is then referred to as a PID record. And uh, depending on what you actually, uh, what information you provide in that PID record, uh, those uh, uh, records and uh, their, uh, in their entirety can become a very uh, interesting and competent uh, uh, system in and of themselves. But instead of actually diving deeper into PID systems as such, um, uh, I would like to stress uh, the, um, uh, uh, the gaps that we are facing today when we are looking at the PID ecosystem. Um, which result uh, uh, essentially from two sources. Uh, the one source is, uh, as I've already mentioned, based on the fact that there is actually more than one PID system uh, um, uh, existing in operation and available today. And uh, uh, if you uh, want to turn this into uh, a coherent uh, a generic uh, service, then you need to be facing uh, a couple of, uh, then you aim for interoperability between those systems. And that then implies uh, a couple of things that we do not actually have available to us today. So a very simple one to start with is a generic global resolution system. By that we mean uh, a service that uh, uh, you can submit a PID to. And no matter who the issuer of that PID was, uh, uh, what technology has been used, uh, uh, that service uh, is able to resolve that PID, uh, provide a PID, uh, uh, the associated PID record, should there be such a thing, uh, and uh, uh, refer to uh, you to the uh, digital object uh, in question. Another thing that um, uh, uh, some PID systems support, uh, but not all PID providers actually enable, is uh, a reverse lookup functionality, uh, essentially meaning that you can ask uh, 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 certain, certain questions and in return you get one or uh, uh, several PIDs that uh, uh, match the result to that question, so essentially used for uh, uh, looking up uh, 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 digital objects. Another thing that originates from the fact that we aim for uh, uh, a federation of PID systems is generic PID minting. And uh, by that we mean that uh, uh, the PID ecosystem as we have it today uh, <laughs> provides a, a, a couple of service providers, many of which have actually their, their own API user interface or machine interface 
uh, uh, for PID minting. And uh, uh, in an ideal world, uh, uh, users shouldn't uh, need to care uh, uh, or software developers, more importantly here even, uh, uh, which PID service or system they are uh, 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 talking to or interacting with, uh, it should all work the same way. And then uh, uh, in this domain, last but not least, uh, uh, a federated approach, of course, is key also to scaling up, which is a very uh, uh, important issue if we look forward uh, to the foreseen uh, uh, application domains and use cases. Uh, if this is a key component, uh, if this is to become a key component uh, in people's uh, uh, workflow and daily business, uh, things need to be rock solid and fast. Now, the other area where we uh, uh, see room for action and uh, identified gaps in today's uh, PID landscape uh, uh, could be subsumed under the uh, uh, term as written here, hidden complexity of metadata. And by that, I mean uh, uh, more precisely what to put into the PID record that I've mentioned before, uh, the fact that in a PID system, you can actually provide metadata alongside the reference to the digital object uh, in question uh, uh, itself. And one specific, uh, uh, specifically interesting kind of uh, uh, additional information or metadata, uh, especially when focusing on uh, machine actionability, is uh, uh, the notion of data typing. This is actually picking up on uh, uh, a recommendation made by the Research Data Alliance uh, a couple of years ago and endorsed by the European Commission uh, as an ICT uh, uh, technical specification. And uh, what is meant here is a, a means by which uh, machines can actually uh, infer from the PID record uh, uh, information about the format of the digital object itself, uh, uh, for instance, in order to figure out uh, 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 what kind of uh, uh, service this could be appropriate input for, or uh, uh, how, how to further process it uh, or extract uh, certain pieces of information. And um, uh, uh, a related notion is what's mentioned second here, namely the uh, uh, kernel information uh, for types uh, 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 and profiles is a term here uh, uh, we use uh, uh, for collecting those in subsets. Again, this is uh, uh, a means to um, uh, incorporate semantics here in a certain uh, way and also to in, uh, enable interoperability with other systems. So essentially a well-defined way uh, by which you can provide uh, uh, metadata uh, uh, alongside a digital object, such as um, uh, ownership, authorship, rights, um, but also relationships, uh, 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 versioning information, uh, uh, and many of these things that could then also be used in order to uh, uh, interconnect objects at the level of PIDs, uh, an interesting and important potential use case thereof uh, uh, could be the support of uh, uh, the notions put forward by the linked data community uh, uh, in the web world, for instance. Uh, and the last thing I would like to mention here are uh, uh, PIDs for services that has been brought up uh, uh, a number of times, but uh, specifically when we are uh, um, looking uh, more oh, sorry, uh, more closely into uh, what that actually means uh, in terms of a PID record, uh, what do you expect? And there you can again make the distinction uh, between uh, a human readable description and a PID that quote unquote, just helps you to identify a certain service or service instance. 
versus a more fully fledged description that would also allow uh, uh, discoverability of that service for machine agents, uh, uh, including information about uh, how the service is to be invoked, uh, uh, which functionality it provides uh, uh, in more detail, the signature uh, uh, of um, uh, functions and methods provided, for instance, and so on. And uh, 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 based on the collection of those gaps, uh, we actually only recently uh, uh, started to, uh, amongst ourselves in the group, uh, uh, to come up with the uh, uh, very first draft or sketch of priorities. And uh, at least in the, uh, amongst the nerds that we are, admittedly, um, uh, we thought, uh, First and foremost, uh, uh, in terms of priority, uh, this here goes from highest to lowest. Um, the, uh, the notion of data type registry and a federation of potentially several registries and a governance model for those registries uh, 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 would be a very important thing to address, uh, not the least because we do not really have that in place today. I mean, there, uh, there are proof of concepts and prototypes. Uh, um, one, for instance, provided by the PID consortium that Ulrich himself is a member of, uh, but this has not found widespread adoption today. Same applies to uh, 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 kernel information types and profiles. So uh, the metadata schemata uh, by which you can uh, uh, provide information uh, within the PID record for uh, a referred to digital object. Then other things uh, probably more straightforward and easier to understand are things like uh, uh, scaling up or the generic global resolution uh, uh, service. PIDs for services is also something that we do not have available today. Uh, for many other things, we do have PIDs, but uh, uh, nothing really established for services to the best of our knowledge. Reverse lookup in comparison, while nice to have, was considered not as important. Uh, and generic PID minting, so this uh, uh, common API for uh, uh, creating PIDs and populating their record, while of course also useful, was not seen amongst us uh, 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 as important as compared to the other ones. That is, of course, just our first um, uh, uh, sketch or draft. Uh, we intend to bring this discussion now up to the architecture working group. And uh, in the not too far distant future, I expect this also uh, uh, to be explicitly addressed uh, to a wider audience, uh, uh, much along the same, uh, uh, in, in a similar vein that we just saw in the previous presentation. Other things where we still not, uh, uh, where we are still working on uh, is um, uh, apart from priorities, we've also been asked to uh, uh, assess in which order this could uh, uh, be addressed uh, in a reasonable way and also to estimate uh, uh, the effort. Uh, but there I do not uh, uh, um, provide you with the state of our discussion as that is pre uh, premature. But this is just in the sense of a status update uh, where we are. And I think I've now used up most of my time and I leave it to Jean-Francois if we allow for one or two questions now, maybe if, if there is something simple and immediate uh, 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 for better understanding. But other than that, I will also be around uh, uh, later today during the clinics. Thanks for your interest and attention. Uh, thanks, Rafael. And uh, uh, again, I recall we have put the link in the in the chat that uh, the document uh, supporting your your presentation, the, the PID architecture document, is available for comment. So that's one one way to uh, to feedback uh, to. Uh, to Raphael's presentation is, of course, to uh, comment and suggest uh, in, in the document. Uh, so what I, we have two minutes uh, before class. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if I can uh, extract one question. Well, maybe, uh, frankly, in two minutes is probably not. Uh, so how about we, we go to the AI and then uh, 
at the end, we'll see. Uh, it's very likely that the Q&A will occur during the, the clinic uh, at 1.30 for the sake of time. Okay, so thanks, Rafael. And now uh, we're, again, changing topic, uh, moving to AI and the floor is uh, for Klaus. So Klaus. Thank you, uh, Jean-Francois. Uh, so I will, uh, in the next hour, present the AI task force. Now I'll try to be a bit uh, shorter than that, but uh, I'm, I'm glad with uh, a bit of extra time. So thank you for that, Rafael. So, uh, so yes, um, this is sort of like a uh, um, moment in time of the uh, AI task force where we are and um, where, we're, where we think we should be going. Um, and the, um, the assignment we were sent away with is uh, kind of uh, along the lines of delivering a consistent architecture for authentication, authorization and access control for EOS. And um, uh, to, um, to satisfy that uh, requirement, we uh, created a task force under the architecture working group um, that uh, is uh, rather large. Um, and not all of these people um, are always participating in the meetings, but we have uh, like a core of um, about 10 people, I would say, that, uh, th that are very active. And, and what is um, more importantly, if you know the people on this list, um, you will realize that they stem both from e-infrastructures and research collaborations. And, and, and that is very important uh, to make sure that we address the, the needs of the, the various players in the, uh, and pardon the buzzword, ecosystem. Um, so what are the main things that we are um, supposed to deliver? Um, we, uh, we started out with a uh, first principles uh, document uh, to make sure that um, that very diverse group that I was talking about in, in my previous slide, that we had a common understanding of what were the, were the important um, elements of an AI uh, for EOSC. Um, then we uh, drafted an, uh, a baseline architecture document, uh, implementing those uh, principles. Um, and, and both of those have been uh, delivered uh, with, the, with the second one, uh, an initial version. And we intend to, in, in a month or so, uh, deliver the final version. Um, thirdly, uh, what we call the rules of participation, uh, document and, and in the context of AI that translates to what does it take for a service provider or an identity provider or a research collaboration to participate in EOSC from an AI point of view and I will uh, come back to that uh, a, a bit later and um, th that document is in draft and we expect it to be um, uh, finalized uh, from a task force point of view uh, very soon. Uh, and lastly, and, and this is the one that uh, we have not done much about and we really need to get, um, get going on is a, a, catal a catalog of, uh, of good examples. There's a lot of material, it just needs organizing and, and put together in a, in a meaningful way. So um, starting with the first principle, um, those of you that, uh, that complain about the, uh, the user experience for logging into the portal will appreciate that um, we, uh, we called out user experience as, uh, as the most important uh, element. Um, if we want to make the EOSC AI a success, it has to be um, as seamless as possible for the users, balancing um, ease of use and security and recognizing that um, no matter how much we want to stimulate open science, open science is not the same as everything always accessible for everyone. Um, there, so there needs to be, uh, there need to be proper access controls for, uh, for elements and, uh, and resources. Um, the other important thing is that we don't want to um, 
start from scratch, uh, try to build a, a trust fabric that is EOSC wide uh, with individual entities. Um, if you look into research into, uh, into human trust, then um, they all come to, you can maintain trust relations with a, somewhere around 150 entities and not beyond that. Beyond that, it doesn't scale. So those of us involved in trust and identity typically say trust doesn't scale. And in order to make it scale, you have no other option than to federate. And, and that is, of course, very much in line with, uh, with some of the basic principles of, uh, of EOSC. So that, so that uh, turns out pretty well. But in our case, that means we take the community, the research community, the research collaboration as the, the basis for building trust between uh, communities. Um, so uh, a lot of that is in place already, not reinventing the wheel. Uh, what we just aim for is that what works today for, a, for an end user will work tomorrow, uh, but just a bit better and just a bit more things are available, etc. And, and lastly, um, and again, um, in line with, with the federation principles that are, uh, are set out, um, we are not intending to build something new from scratch uh, that is the EOSC AAI. Uh, the EOSC AAI is going to be a distributed uh, system where we agree on the, um, on the interoperation between the different systems and, um, and, and it should be open for anyone that plays by the rules. So, Going from that to a more practical um, point is um, how does that translate into an architecture? And, um, and again, going back to this not reinventing the wheel, um, there is a large body of work uh, out there, um, uh, mostly based on um, the uh, on, on a number of uh, studies that have been uh, uh, taken uh, uh, have been performed in the um, in the research communities, and as a result of that, um, a, a project was uh, created: ARC uh, Authentication and Authorization for Research Communities, and later an ARC II uh, project. And the main deliverables of that project has been, apart from a a collaboration between e-infras and research infras uh, it has been the so-called ARC blueprint architecture that has been uh, adopted by most of the uh, larger uh, research collaborations in the world and, and provides a, a, a clear um, architecture and, uh, and provides clear guidance uh, on how to uh, how to build an AAI that um, has the highest chances of, um, of interoperating with uh, other research infrastructures. Um, I don't, I, 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 I'm not going to explain the complete uh, ARC blueprint architecture, but if you, uh, if you look at the picture in the left, then it's definitely um, pretty complex. And I'm not going to lie about it. Um, AI is pretty complex. It, it has a strong security uh, component. Uh, so so it's, it's not easy. But if you look a little bit more careful, you will see that there is one red line with the exception from the user consent uh, dialogue, one red line going from a user to the whole system and one blue line from a service into the system. So that means that while those of us that operate an AAI, like EGI, like Geant, uh, like EUDAT, um, definitely uh, uh, have our, uh, our work uh, cut out for us for the coming years, but from an end user or a service provider point of view, it is uh, relatively straightforward. Um, one one uh, pretty recent development is that um, because everybody started implementing the ARC Blueprint architecture, uh, we have come to realize that 
this same architecture figures in two different ways. It figures as an interface from a research community to the rest of the world, but also from a provider of services to the rest of the world. So if you, again, uh, talk about EU Dutch, Cheant, EGI, etc., we all offer services that are made available through an R blueprint architecture compatible service. Uh, and, and we so we now distinguish between a community AAI and an infrastructure uh, proxy. And lastly, of course, th that can be a uh, multi-tenant, but uh, I, I think that that kind of uh, speaks for itself. Um, I mentioned the collaboration. Um, that was an important uh, other result of, uh, of ARC. Um, what what as sort of like the heritage of the art project there is a group called Aegis that's what you get from having Greeks as chairs um, they come up with Greek names um, and again you see here uh, the 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 e infrastructures and uh, the uh, the research infrastructures large research collaborations uh, get here together and agree on a common way. Of, of doing things, of dealing with attributes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we expect this group uh, to continue growing. And we expect this group to be the one that is a, a logical um, uh, body to, to discuss from an ears point of view uh, with. So, so far, all good. Um, our blueprint architecture, Aegis, um, so we, um, we, we're good to go. Um, unfortunately, um, there are some, uh, some issues, uh, some unsolved uh, problems. And uh, well, maybe I should say fortunately, because it, uh, it keeps me in my job. Uh, but um, and, and um, a lot of it has to do with uh, attributes. Uh, attributes are used typically to base authorization decisions on and, uh, and that's a pretty complex um, of, of things. In, in the R blueprint architecture, we assume that there's sort of like an attribute authority that is uh, authoritative for all attributes. In reality, uh, the source, the authoritative source of attributes lies often outside the collaboration. Um, same attribute can mean different things in different contexts, et cetera. And, uh, there are discussions about uh, specific attributes, like, for example, in um, in the life sciences community, uh, the, the 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 need for a researcher attribute came up. And once you start discussing what a researcher is, uh, you immediately get into lots of um, of problems. That across in different countries, it means something very different. Uh, for different collaborations, it means something very different. So there's a lot of harmonization work going on here on, on attributes. Um, the second um, uh, main challenge is uh, multi-infrastructure workflows. So combining uh, resources from different infrastructures, for example, the example I gave here is uh, a Jupyter notebook uh, from provider A and, and, and you wanting to store the results in provider B. We do make that work, uh, but frankly speaking, it's a bit of a kludge with uh, introspection of, uh, um, of tokens, etc. So, so not at all pretty. Uh, again, there's a lot of work going on in this area uh, for those uh, interested. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, along the lines of OpenID Connect Federation. Um, and lastly, and that's the one I want to uh, talk a little bit uh, more about, is, is about scalability. And um, uh, well, someone famous once said, the only problem the internet has is scalability. Uh, maybe that's a bit um, uh, short, but uh, I, I think, um, He's up to something, and, uh, and it's definitely in the context of EOS something we need to be very much aware of. That uh, it, it's easy to build something that is successful for 100 entities, for 1,000 it gets a little bit harder, and when when you talk about hundreds of thousands, it gets uh, pretty hairy uh, pretty soon. So. 
um, and, and they have to do with some of the assumptions uh, that uh, were made in the uh, in the ARC uh, project and for the ARC blueprint architecture. And the idea was that there are lots of research communities out there and uh, including uh, long tail collaborations, so short lived collaborations, for example. So that could be a very high number, but the number of so called infrastructure proxies, so the, the interface to um, the infrastructure providers, would be relatively low. Um, as, I, I, as I will come to, that, that turns out not to be the case um, uh, because. Um, for example, currently the, uh, the um, assumption is that many nation states will stand up also uh, uh, research infrastructures and, and that uh, pretty much uh, makes the, the number go up to, to a number that we cannot easily support uh, anymore. Um, and, and of course, um, uh, so far we have done a lot on bilateral uh, agreement between research infrastructures and e-infras, um, but if we want to scale it, we need to get beyond bilateral agreements. So to, to uh, illustrate my, my last uh, point about scalability, uh, a, a bit of a lesson learned from the EOSC Hub project. There we did precisely what, uh, what I described in the R Blueprint uh, model. Um, we had uh, community AIs uh, happened to be provided by uh, e-infras, but, but that doesn't really uh, matter to the principle. Um, and we had infrastructure proxies also uh, operated by the e-infrastructures. And uh, we made them work. And, and, and when I say we made them work, we're here really talking about hands-on configuration work to make sure that a user connected to uh, one of the community AIs can access a service connected to one of the uh, infrastructure proxies. And, and as you can see, that is very much an N by N problem. So all of the members of the EOSC Hub AI are there in the community AIs and infrastructures, and all of the interoperability is based on the ARC Blueprint uh, guidelines, but the big problem sits here in the middle, uh, N times M relations, and, and we need to, uh, to find a solution because if you now extrapolate this and you assume that there will be hundreds of uh, community AIs and and at least dozens of uh, infrastructure proxies, it soon gets uh, pretty uh, awkward. But there's good news. Um, and, and that good news is that we are uh, working on defining uh, an, uh, a layer in between. I'm a computer scientist. Once it gets complex, you introduce an extra layer. That's precisely what we're doing here. But but looking at it from a, an identity federation uh, perspective, um, it, there's another interesting uh, property. When you, when you look at identity federations, typically what they do is they, um, they scale having uh, many identity providers and many, many service providers by introducing the concept of a federation, a trusted, entity that manages the trust relations from identity providers and service providers uh, to make it a, instead of an order n times m uh, problem uh, make it an order n plus m uh, problem and in fact that is precisely what we do here so the eosc aai federation that we um, that that we intend to build is precisely that. It's a federation of community AIs and infrastructure proxies that make sure that there doesn't have to be a bilateral trust relation between every community AI and every e-infra proxy. So going back to my, my uh, slide about the first principle, we are slightly expanding on those first principles that in the task force we, uh, we agreed on. Um, it's all about multilateral, so no bilateral interactions and trust, but all multilateral. Um, 
doing that, we do want to maintain the autonomy of all the members. So you don't have to trust everyone in order to participate in the EOSC AI. You as a community or you as an, uh, as an identity provider or you as a service provider, you decide what, uh, who, you, you, who you're going to trust. Uh, to put it in, um, uh, in DNS uh, terms uh, to, uh, to uh, imitate uh, Raphael, what you basically would do is we provide a, a DNS sec lookup, but uh, so you know you talk to the right endpoint that doesn't say anything about what is behind that endpoint and whether you can trust whatever that, uh, that endpoint uh, tells you. Um, we make sure that, uh, that attributes can flow uh, and, and are meaningful in the context of a particular uh, collaboration. And very importantly, the user is at the, uh, at the helm always. They decide what information about them can be uh, shared and, and, and for how long it, uh, it can be shared. And, and that brings me to my last slide. Um, so looking at the bigger picture uh, with the uh, AAI interoperability framework that we, uh, that we are uh, defining and the rules of participation, we make it possible for EOS services to become available in the EOSC AAI Federation. And uh, we make it possible for those services to consume identities it gets through the AAI Federation and all of that with the aim to make it as seamless as possible for end users. So as an end user, you should be able to go to a service, select the organization that can uh, vouch for you and you have access. Thank you. Jean-Francois, I think you're muted. Thanks a lot, class. And, uh... Uh, you know, and uh, uh, thanks for all the speakers. We're right on time, and uh, and uh, while the content, uh, I think, of your three presentations was uh, carried over. Uh, so thanks a lot. I think it's a, it's an important moment at the end of this transition period that we we transfer to the new EOSC uh, organization. Uh, you know where we are on key topics such as the one uh, that uh, we covered during this session, the fair practices, the PID and AI, very, very different challenges, but uh, very, very significant challenges. And uh, so thanks to, to all of you. Uh, for the sake of time, so this is the half hour you have to, uh, you know, the whole audience has to for lunch since we're having another session starting at uh, 12.30. Uh, I mean, please go back to the clinic at 1.30 and uh, we'll do as much as we can. But I will close by saying uh, also, don't forget that uh, documents, uh, there's been a comment on the chat on uh, how do we exchange and so forth. And of course, the chat is just used for the meeting, for the, for the presentations, but the documents are uh, open for PID and, and well, for, uh, there are many documents. The whole list is in the essential reading uh, section of the EOS Symposium uh, homepage. And uh, that's where the deep uh, feedback can occur, right? You have the, the, the text uh, present where we stand at the moment, the text, plural, uh, present where we stand at the moment and, uh, and the, the, the feedback needs to occur on those texts uh, in order to be organized and, uh, uh, and that the exchange uh, uh, goes through. So again, thanks a lot for the presenters. Looking forward for the feedback uh, uh, on the documents and uh, good appétit, bon appétit, comme on dit en français. <laughs> uh, and uh, we will resume uh, 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 at 12.30 uh, uh, for, the, for the next session. I think the Dutch were in the majority in this uh, meeting, so I would say eight smakelijk. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, class. <laughs> yeah, enjoy the... lunch. And we will take the chat and make sure that's fed through to the groups as well. So thanks for the comments. Thanks, everybody. Guten Appetit zu sagen für die Deutschen unter uns.